And without further delay, I'd like to introduce our featured presenter today. He is recruiting and corporate hiring consultant, Gary O'Neill, and he will be presenting on acing the interview and landing the job. Gary, you now have the floor. Thank you so much, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Gary O'Neill, and I'm here today to talk to you about how to ace your interview. Um, for those of you who haven't been in one of my sessions before, I usually just tell you just a little bit about me so that you kind of understand the perspective that I take. So I've trained hundreds of hiring managers on, uh, on how to hire great and how to interview hundreds of recruiters and literally thousands of individuals with respect to this entire process. Um, I run recruiting teams of up to about 30, have been in, uh, inside of 250, 300 companies at this point doing recruitment consulting. Um, and that ranges from very large corporations like Microsoft and Dell uh, down to startups in technologies, in healthcare, in manufacturing, in restaurants, and lots of different things. So I've, I've seen a lot. I learn a lot every single day. Um, my perspective is one that if you understand how the game is played, it's a lot easier to win. So rather than just kind of telling you about your interview from an outside perspective, I'm going to take you inside the world of a recruiter and inside the world of a hiring manager, uh, let you kind of see what it is that we see, and that will probably make a lot more sense with regard to success in your interview. Here's what I can promise you. And that is that if you understand, like I said, how the game is played, and that's with regard to your LinkedIn profile, your resume, your everything to do with your with your job search, we have sessions on those too. This is a, a pretty critical piece, which is acing your interview. I, I want to introduce a, a, a something here real quick, um, which is this concept. And let me bring up this slide. Hang on one second. So I, I want to start out with this which is at the end of an interview, people always ask, they'll ask you as an individual, they'll ask the interviewer, they'll ask the hiring manager, people often ask this question, hey, how did it go? How did it go? Here's what, I'm, uh, here's what I can tell you, is that I think of it in these terms, which is exclamation point, or if you're a Unix person, that's called bang, and that's a really good thing. Question is about, hmm, Hmm, I'm not sure. Hmm. And splat, you probably know what splat means. Uh, it didn't go so well if your interview was a splat. So I really think in terms of interviews, in fact, we use this internally on my team um, as to whether an interview ended in a bang, a question, or a splat. I'm here to tell you that probably, oh, 20% ended in a splat, which is it's just flat out over. About, oh, uh, you know, at least 60%, maybe 70%. Um, end up as, yeah, well, maybe, I'm not sure, question mark. And only about 10% of the time following an interview does the hiring manager essentially give us the feedback called, oh, awesome, that was great, right? That was great. So my objective in this whole session is to help you move toward the exclamation mark and help you understand what it means to run an interview where afterwards, essentially what's coming out of the interviewer's um, mouth and attitude is one of, oh, that was great, right? You can even hear it in their voice. When I follow up with a hiring manager or an interviewer, I say, hey, how did it go? They're like, uh, okay, uh, you know, that's the answer that I get most of the time. Well, yeah, all right, and you know, I want to see some more candidates, huh? All right, we want to move from that into, oh yeah, that was great. So, and here's one of the reasons why, is because doubt creeps in. What happens is that when somebody, when you end your interview and the interviewer's take is, meh, you know, yeah, all right, I, I like them all right. I mean, I could see them as a member of our team. Doubt is insidious. Doubt begins to creep in, which means over time, their impression doesn't get better. Over time, their impression usually gets worse. And unfortunately, the reality is that probably 70% of all the hires that I see happen um, they're hiring somebody who's still a question mark because they need to hire somebody now and they're still not absolutely positive. So again, this whole session is about how to help you get toward where it's not just a question that you leave your interview with, but you leave as an exclamation point and they go, okay, wow, that was great. So that's what we're trying to achieve today. So I'll close that and hopefully that makes sense, but that's kind of how I think about it. All right. 
Someone skip that. By the way, there's a, there will be, if it's not there already, let's see, is it there yet? Yep, there's a couple of handouts. One of the handouts that you have in this little webinar platform is acing your interview PDF. That's the exact same document that I'm going through. And then we'll also do some interview follow-up pieces so you can uh, download those two pieces and follow along with me. So uh, let's get started. So here's the thing. Um, a lot of times, and most of the time, it feels like an interview is about you. And it feels like you're on one side of the table and the interviewer is on the other side of the table and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and the focus is on you. The truth of the matter is, is that the interview really isn't about you. The interview is really about the problem that the company has and it needs to be solved because no company ever hires anyone unless there's a problem that needs to be solved. So if you go into an interview, and this is just introductory stuff, this is just kind of an attitude I want you to have. If you go into an interview with the idea that you're there to discover whether or not you're gonna be able to help these other individuals who work in this company solve the problem that they have, things are gonna go much better for you. One, um, it'll take the pressure off of you because you realize that the interview isn't really about you. The interview is really about the problem that they have and whether or not you're the best person to help them solve that problem. Um, and then the other thing I want to encourage you to consider is, you know, consider the problem that the people you're talking to currently have. You know, in this list here, I say, you know, what is the interviewer's problem? Well, the interviewer's problem, a lot of times, the first people who are interviewing you might be somebody in HR. It might be a recruiter. It may be somebody else who is on the team, somebody who isn't the hiring manager. You know, what is their problem right now in this interview? Well, the problem that they have in the interview right now is that most of the people who are gonna interview you don't interview a lot of people. They, they don't interview a lot of people. They're not necessarily really comfortable in this interview. And the problem that they have is they're gonna to have to make a recommendation as to whether or not you move forward in the process. And so as an example, as an interviewer, as a recruiter, if I move you forward in the interview process and the next person I'm moving forward to is the hiring manager um, and it didn't go well with the hiring manager, that's a really bad re reflection on me. And so the problem that I've got is always evaluating people to determine whether or not the person who is next in line to talk to this individual is going to say, hey, Gary, that was a really great candidate or whether or not they're gonna say, that was a total waste of my time. You know, Why did you send that person forward to me? So my point is, is that recognize that anytime you're in an interview, that interviewer has a lot of pressure on them because they're either deciding to move you forward in the process and they're subjecting themselves to success or failure just like you are. If they move you forward and it doesn't go well, that's a bad reflection on them if, it, if they move you forward and, and it go, does go well, um, it is a good reflection of them. Let me show you a real-time example of what I mean by this as a recruiter. I'm gonna take you into my email account right this very second. Um, can you see my screen, by the way, Kelly? Can you see my screen? Yes, all good. Okay. Yeah, we see okay, your email great. now. Okay, awesome. So um, check this out. Um, where is it? Um, first hour, one second, this won't take me very long from like, this is my real email. This is my work email. Um, so here's an example of a bang, right? So this is a new hiring manager for me, a new company for me, and a very, very difficult technical um, interview, very difficult technical position, really hardcore security stuff. Um, and all I can tell you is that I have one candidate in play. I was sweating bullets with respect to what this manager was going to say, because this is the first candidate I've had an interview and I've been working on this one for three weeks. Check this out. Steven is the, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So I'm, I'm just, again, I'm taking you on the inside of the reality of a recruiter who's sweating bullets based upon whether or not this interview went well that happened yesterday. So I got this message this morning from the person who's the COO of the company. Steven, who's highlighted right there, is the CTO. And uh, the COO says, I interviewed Joe Chow yesterday afternoon. He's a strong candidate that enjoys the pace and atmosphere of a startup. He's extremely interested in our technology. His most recent work around Java Spring for a local startup has run aground. Will you work with Gary to schedule for next week? Woo! Bang, right? 
that was a bang, right? So I'm sitting here, I was sweating bullets because I wasn't sure that I was absolutely on target. I was pretty sure that I was. That could have just as easily turned into a message that says, why did you waste my time? What is it about this role that you don't understand? And uh, so my point is, the pressure is on. Recruiting and hiring is difficult. Recruiting and hiring is risky. And so going all the way back to the problem, recognize that when you're in an interview, what the interviewer's problem is because they've got a very difficult decision to make. And the truth is, if you make their decision a whole lot easier, things are gonna go better for you. And in this session, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to make that go a whole lot better. So what's the hiring manager's problem? They actually have to make the decision as to whether, not just whether you move forward in the interview process, but they have to make the decision as to whether they're gonna hire you and make an offer to you. Here's the deal. Most hiring managers don't hire a lot of people. They hire one or two people a year. It's a huge decision for them because every single problem that a company has is created by people, right? Every problem that a company has is created by someone. And uh, so hiring a person is the riskiest thing that a company can do. It's the most expensive thing that a company can do. And as a hiring manager who doesn't hire a whole lot, the pressure is on me because I must be hiring somebody because I got a lot of work that needs to be get done or some kind of a problem that needs to be solved. And if I make the wrong decision, it's a career limiting move for me. In fact, I can lose my job if I make the wrong decision. So there's a lot of pressure. Now, finally, let's talk about the other problem. The real reason why any job is open ever, the only reason why any company ever hires anyone is because the company has a problem. And what I mean by problem, it might be a good problem, and the best kind of problem is one called, hey, we have closed so much business that we need more people, right? We have so much business that we can't deliver right now. We need more people. That's still a problem. That just turns out to be a good problem, uh, but it is still a very real problem for them. What I, My point in all of this is that when you go into an interview, if you go into an interview with the idea that the interview is about you, and if you go into an interview with the idea that it's about getting a job, um, that's the way most people do it. You know, that's the way that most people do it. But my suggestion is you can do a lot better than that. You go into an interview understanding that there is a problem that the company has, that you're being evaluated with respect to your ability to solve the problems that the company has, that the interview isn't about you, and it isn't even about getting a job. The interview is about interacting with another person who has a problem that they need to solve and working with that other individual to, to determine together whether or not you're a great person to solve those problems. Does that make sense? I think that that takes a lot of pressure off and I think that it changes the dynamic of what can happen in an interview. If you go into an interview thinking that your job is just to sit there and people are gonna ask you questions, you're gonna answer them, you're doing the same thing that 95% of everybody does. I'm gonna encourage you to do something a little bit different than that, which is really gonna help you stand out um, and be seen as the candidate of choice. So the job really does equal, can you solve the problem, right? The job equals, can you solve the problem? The other thing I wanna share with you is, most interviewers don't recognize it, but I'm geeky enough that I've kind of paid attention to this a long time. I make my living because companies are able to hire great people, right? I make my living because people get hired. Um, is how I do it. And so over the years, I've kind of been watching this and figuring out what's really going on behind the scenes. And as far as I can tell in the interview process, there's really five underlying interview questions that are in the interviewer's mind, whether or not they recognize it or not. And if you answer these questions in their mind, um, then things will go much better for you. Um, the questions that are happening, I think, are, who are you? What problems can you solve? In other words, what do you do? Who are you? What do you do? Can you help me and can you help my business? Do you have proof that you're gonna be able to do those things? And the ultimate decision that I'm making in an interview is, is it worth considering you further? Should I move you forward in the interview process? And then eventually, is it worth making you an offer? That's what's going on. Who are you? What problems do you solve? How can you help me and how can you help my business? Do you have proof that you're gonna be able to do those things and is it worth considering you further? So here's the deal on those. 
So what problems can you solve? What do you do really has to do with what are your, what are your skills? What are your tasks that you can perform? You know, what tools do you know how to use? What's in your repertoire of tricks and understanding? You know, it's those kinds of things. The next one, can you help me and my business is where things start to get interesting. So some of you are transitioning into IT roles. So I'll just use that as an example. Um, IT professionals are notorious for thinking that the job is about information technology. The job is never about information technology. What the job is really about is ensuring that the company is more successful through its use of information technologies. So if you go into an interview for an IT role and what you think of how you're helping someone and helping your business is by configuring laptops and configuring networks and making security work, that's true. Those are the tasks you're going to perform. But my suggestion to you is that if you really understand that you're there to help the business by keeping users productive, by protecting company assets, by minimizing costs associated with IT, and to ensure that everything that you do ultimately has a bottom line impact for the company in terms of more revenue, decreased cost, increased quality, user satisfaction, right? Those kinds of things is the impact to the business. So regardless of whether you're in IT or whether you're in medical billing and coding, whether you're in office management, whether you're in accounting, it doesn't matter what it is that you do. If you go into this interview understanding that it's really not about the tools that you have and the skills that you have, it's really about your deeper understanding that it's about solving businesses problem, uh, particularly if you're in IT or some of those roles where it's, where it's notorious that they think it's about the skills, you'll be the one professional who stands out as the person who understands that ultimately what you do is there to make the business more successful. Now, not only are you there to make the business more successful, you're there to make the hiring manager more successful. Um, you know, there was a, one, of, one, of, one of the hires that I made in my life that still stands out to me, it was actually about 20 years ago, um, but it was probably the best hire that I ever made. Started with a message that I received from this individual and the subject line on the message was, I eat Unix for breakfast. And the body of the message was, and I'll work like a dog to ensure that you're successful. And I was just like, whoa, I have to talk to this person. So the people, when I, when I have a client who's really interested in someone and the interview has ended in a bang, it's almost always because, you know, the, the ability to do the work is kind of jacks are better to open. If you can't do the work, they can't possibly hire you. I always put people in front of my hiring managers who can do the work. The thing that makes them set apart, the thing that makes sets people apart the most, and what I hear back when hiring managers are excited is basically, not only is that person going to be really good at doing their job, in fact, they might not be the strongest person of all the people I talk to in terms of their skill set, but their drive, their commitment, their motivation to help me and to get things done, wow, that's off the charts. That's the reason why you get hired is because you're there to help that individual and you're there to help the business be successful, right? That next question, do you have proof? That's, that's really kind of where your training, that's where your certifications come in. That's where your ability to show the work, how you, the work that you did in the past translates into your success in the future. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to tell me you can be successful in this role. It's another thing to give me a little bit of proof so that I can believe that you can do what it is that you say that you want to do. So the reason why I belabor this part is because in your interview, a lot of it is going to be about your focus on helping the other individual be successful in their role, your focus on making sure that you're helping their team be successful, and your focus on understanding how what you do contributes to the success of the business. Those, that kind of focus is going to be the thing that shifts you from being, ah, eh, they went all right. I mean, yeah, they're okay. I mean, whatever, to I have to have this person on my team. So I'm just going to pause there for a second to let that soak in, see if you have any questions or whatever, because we're about to dive into how do you go about doing this. I just want to set the stage and help you understand what your interview is really about. All right, Gary, we currently don't have any questions, but some of them okay. might pop up shortly. <laughs> okay, no worries. All right, so here's the deal. Your objectives in your interview are to connect with the other person, to really discuss the problem and how you're going to solve it, and ultimately, um, never forget that your interview is never about getting the job. 
your interview is always about getting to the next step. So when you interview with me as a recruiter over the phone, the next step is getting me to present you to the organization. The next step after that is to have that first interview and then the second one and the third one. And eventually the next step is the job. But really your interview is always about getting to the next step. As soon as you think that your interview is all the way about landing the job, you're wrong. And you probably came into it with the wrong idea and the wrong attitude. At the end of the day, if your focus in the interview is about landing a job, that's kind of a, a, a you know, that's a, a self-serving motivation. People feel it and it just isn't going to go as well. It's always about discussing the problem with the other person, figuring out whether you're the right person to solve it and getting to the next step. All right, let's talk about how to do this. So that um, title up at the top, it's all in the preparation. We're going to spend the majority of our ta time talking about how to prepare for an interview. And here's the reason why, because I'd venture to say that fewer than 5% of all of the people who I interview are even close to what I'd consider to be properly prepared. And the reason why I say that is because I get that back from hiring managers all the time. And, you know, if, here's the deal. If you do not have the ability to do the work, you will not get hired. So my assumption is, that you have the ability to do the work because otherwise nothing else matters. If you can't do the work, then you're not going to get hired. I mean, if I was going to interview for a job as a neurosurgeon, um, I, I can't do the work. So I'm clearly not going to get hired. So we go into this with this idea that you have the ability to do the work. You have the skills to do the work. You have the training to do the work and you have the education to do the work. And by the way, quick aside, for the kind, if you're in career transition um, and you're moving into a new role that you haven't really done professionally yet, um, that happens every single day. That happens a whole lot. Everybody who is in IT or in medical billing and coding or in whatever it is that they do started out at one time having not done that professionally. So everybody who's currently done it has already gone through the same transition that you might be facing. So it's very, very doable. There's tens of thousands of people who do it every single day. Um, and so, you know, if you're just transitioning in, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they expect you to be an expert. It doesn't mean that they expect you to not be learning things. In fact, they expect you, you're going to learn a lot. Um, but, you know, no matter what, there's some level of competency that you have to have. If you're over the bar of the competency that you have to have, then the thing that's going to separate you from the pack, the thing that's going to have you be the person who gets the job, by the way, every single day, um, the majority of candidates who I see get hired aren't necessarily the person with the strongest skills and experience. It's the person with the skills and experience that's good enough who's the right person who really is driven and motivated in the rest. And, and being able to demonstrate that is all in your preparation for the interview. And that's what we're here to talk to you about right now. All right. Here's my suggestion for how to do it. And if I was going into an interview, this is exactly what I would do. Step number one is to really understand the company. When I interview people almost every, I interview people every single day. And if you were in an interview with me, what you would find out is after a little bit of small talk, one of the first things that I would do is let's just pretend that your name is Kelly. And, um, you know, I would say, well, Kelly, you know, thanks so much for coming in. I really, you know, uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm just curious, you know, did you have a chance to, you know, learn anything about it? Did you check out Allen Corporation's website? And usually the answer is, yeah, I mean, I took a look at it and that's all they have to say. And I kind of go, oh, okay, well, let's, you know, I just didn't want to waste your time telling you about things that you already know. And in my mind, I'm kind of going, you didn't do anything, right? Really? We're here to talk about stuff and you don't really understand anything about the company. That happens to me 95% of the time. They know the surface level at best. Now, in the rare occasion that about 5% of the time I say, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. You know, I not only went over their website, but I see who their leadership team is. This is the person who's likely to be my hiring man. And they go on, they tell me all kinds of stuff. I'm kind of going, all right, this person is on the ball and they already really stood out as somebody who's likely to be a great candidate. Because remember, my problem is that I have to present somebody over to the organization who I'm going to be confident that they're going to say, hey, that was a really good use of my time. Because as a recruiter, most jobs, I present three to five people and one gets hired. 
So that means that in general, most of the people we interview aren't going to get hired, but at least don't want the hiring manager to be able to say, hey, that was great. I really enjoyed meeting with that person. So here's my suggestion of what you need to do to understand the company. I'll, I'm going to show you what the outcome is, and then I'll show you how to go get this information. Step number one is to really understand the company. And you need to be able to respond when somebody says, hey, what do you know about our company or some equivalent of that? I think that you need to have a one to two minute answer. And I think that what you ought to do is you ought to take a piece of paper and a pen. You could do it on a computer if you want to, but I find something more powerful about writing it on paper. And you need to write a one company, some one page company summary. When I'm going to meet a new client, or a new potential client and try to close the deal to help them with recruiting services, this is exactly what I do. I mean, literally, this is exactly what I do. And this is the pattern that I use. So here's the pattern. Let's look at this first line. I made this company up, but retail online solutions help small to medium online retailers drive targeted traffic to their client's website and convert the traffic into sales. So I probably ought to headline this sometime, but essentially what we're talking about in, in this line, right, I'm gonna grab my highlighter, um, in this line right here, right? Oh, I didn't mean to cover that up. Um, but essentially what we're doing is the one line summary of what this company is all about. The second line right here is about their products, right? It's about their products and services. and let me be really clear. This is the pattern that I use when I'm putting together a company summary for a new client meeting. This is exactly the pattern that I would use if I was going into interview for a job. I have one or two lines that really summarize the company. I next move to one or two lines about the products and services that the company has. So the products and services include everything from initial design through launch, as well as ongoing maintenance and management of retail websites. Again, I made this one up, but there you can get it. The third line is what's their key differentiator? What makes them different from other organizations? And literally you might say a key differentiator is complete analytics that are built into each site to show trends and areas for website and traffic improvement. Then you move to who the ideal clients are likely to be. Ideal clients are retailers who don't currently have an online store, or online retailers looking to take their business to the next level. If you can, some example clients, and sometimes they're on their website, sometimes you know that. Um, and then wrap it up with something about what you understand about the company, which might be growth about the company, how many people they've hired in the last little while, news articles that you might find off of, uh, off of uh, Google. I'll show you how to do all this stuff in just a minute. And that wraps it up really nicely. So imagine this. Imagine that you work at Retail Online Solutions. Imagine that you're interviewing someone. You've had just a little bit of a small talk. Um, you do what 80% of the time an interviewer does and say, so I'm just curious, you know, what do you, what do you know about our company? Why would you be interested in working here? Imagine that I responded by saying, well, Retail Online Solutions, I know that you guys help small to medium online retailers and you drive targeted traffic to your clients' websites and clearly help them convert that traffic into sales. Um, when I looked at your products and services, it looks like you do everything from initial design all the way through you know, implementation and launch and then the ongoing maintenance and management, primarily of retail websites, I believe. Um, what seems to set you guys apart from some of the others is that the analytics you have built into your tool seem to be a lot stronger than some of the others because, I, I mean, I looked at Bizarre Voice and I looked at, you know, a couple of your competitors and I can see how the analytics um, that you provide in your sample reports are, are a lot stronger than what your competitions are. Uh, and that way you can drive you know, a lot more traffic or, or measure the traffic that's coming to the websites. Um, it would appear that your ideal clients, I'm not sure, but it looks like your ideal clients are probably retailers, um, many of whom don't have a current online store. They know they need to get online. Amazon is beating them to the, the punch right now. Um, and uh, also those online retailers who are using something simple like, oh, Big Commerce or Volusion, which are a couple of your competitors, um, you know, if they're ready, really ready to step up to the next level. Um, from what I can tell, some of your ideal or some of your standout clients are widgets.com, Thinking Toys, and Geek Space. I went and checked out both of those. Their sites are beautiful. Congratulations. Um, and, you know, what I've seen about your company in terms of its culture, I know that you've hired about 17 people in the last few months. Um, and uh, everything that I heard on Glassdoor and everything in the rest and, uh, and a couple of other re 
you know, a little bit of research says that you, know, you got a really strong customer service orientation and your clients seem to really like you. All right. My point is, is that I have almost zero candidates who could do that. And all I know is if you get the opportunity to go into an interview and you're able to understand where the client that you're going into that much, they now really like you. They really like you. They really like you. And the truth is that, have you ever heard of this thing? It's called confirmation bias, confirmation bias. It's this weird psychological thing that we have as humans that it has to do with, I like to be right. And it has to do with first impressions and why they matter. And the point is that what confirmation bias means is that as soon as I decide something, I'm now in the mode of reinforcing my decision. So as soon as I see you walk in the door late, I've decided something about you and I'm now in the mode of reinforcing that decision. As soon as I see you in a shirt that looks like you slept in, I just decided something about you and um, I'm, I'm now trying to reinforce that decision. As soon as in the interview I say, so tell me about your company and you say, um, yeah, I looked at your website. Um, yeah, no, it looks like a really interesting company. I heard that you guys have good benefits and you start going down this path of what's in it for me. I just decided something about you and I just decided, hmm, you just became a question mark in my head, not an exclamation point. Um, so the entire, the entire success of your interview is taking every single opportunity from the moment you drive into the parking lot all the way through to have these moments of making yourself a exclamation mark instead of a question or a splat. And if you understand the company really well, it's one of the things that's really going to make you stand out. And uh, I don't mean to to, uh, to overemphasize that, but I probably need to overemphasize that because it's the thing that you can do that's going to make more difference than anything else, quite frankly. All right. So there's that. So it's all in the preparation. And uh, what I want you to do is to, um, I'm trying to get rid of my drawing tool. Hang on one second. Okay, cool. And uh, I'm going to scroll this thing up. All right. Now, there's more that you could figure out. And, and my suggestion to you is just use this page that I have here as an example of what you ought to figure out. It shouldn't take you more than about 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour to figure this out. And it can make all the difference in the world. You can find out about their location and their size. You can find out about current events. You can find out about history. You can find out about their leadership. And if you take this little framework that I gave you and you write down this kind of a summary, then you'll really know it. The reason why to write it down, by the way, is you remember way back like in high school or whenever you were in school, if you had a teacher who let you bring in a three, five, three by five note card with things written on it really tiny, interesting thing, you might not have needed it in the test because you learned it when you were writing it down. It's the same thing. If you just go research this stuff and you don't write it down, you're not going to remember it nearly as well as when you write it down. So I do this for clients. I spend about 30, 45 minutes on it for a new client and I go into the meeting that well prepared. All right. So step number one in being prepared for your interview is to deeply understand the company and uh, that will really set you apart. Step number two is to really deeply understand the problem that the client has. And I don't mean the skills and the tasks they want you to perform. I'm talking about the real problem. Why is this job open? Why are they hiring somebody? Why is it that this role even matters, right? Go understand um, that they're, when there's an open position and they're interviewing you for a position, there must be some kind of a need. There must be some kind of a problem. So my suggestion is that if you take it beyond the idea that it's just skills that you're going to use and tools that you're going to use and tasks you're going to perform and understand that you do those things for a reason, then that's another thing that's going to really make you stand out and not be like everybody else. And I'm going to beat on IT people for a little while. They're the world's worst in thinking that the job is really about configuring laptops and thinking it's about user, you know, end user support and thinking that it's about all the technical stuff that you learned. You know what? It's never about that. It's always about your ability to make the other person smile, your ability to listen and understand what the client uh, or the, what the user needs to solve their problems expediently and quickly the very first time to keep people productive, to keep, you know, costs low. 
Um, that's really what your job is all about. That's really what the problem is. All right, so let's talk about how to define the problem. Um, so, and by the way, before I do that, I wanna back, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wanna back up just a second and I wanna show you where to get this information from. Can I show you that? I wanna show you that. So my suggestion to you is that the first place you go to find information about a company is you go to LinkedIn. And here's the reason why. Almost every company that you're going to work with has a LinkedIn page. And the reason why I like going to LinkedIn to find out about it is because they have a very um, defined amount of space that you can write stuff about your company. And it's not real long and exhaustive because when you go to a client's website, then it's page after page after page of all kinds of marketing garbage. And you got to, I shouldn't say garbage, sometimes it's not. Uh, but you got to wade your way through all of that kind of stuff. Um, so let's do this. Um, B-U-I-L-D, Builder Home Site. <clears throat> That's not what I wanted. Builder Home Site. There it is, Builder Home Site. Builder Home Site is uh, one of my clients right this very second. And I haven't been to their page, so we'll see exactly what their page says, but it's right here, Builder Home Site Incorporated. So let me back up. The way that you search in LinkedIn is if I was here at like my home page, then you just start putting in the company's name, Builder, in this case, Home Site, and there they are. So I click on Builder Home Site and it takes me to that company's page. So starting at the very top, here's what I can learn about this company. They're in Austin, Texas. They have 214 employees. I'm gonna go ahead and open this in a new tab and we'll take a look at that in a minute, right? Now what I can do is in this About Us section, I can see more and I bet you anything, the majority of what we need to know is right here. Headquartered in Austin, Texas, Builder Home Site was founded with the mission to bring, here's, the, here's their thing, Builder Home Site brings home building industry leaders together to develop world-class technology solutions, okay. Kind of weak, but it's okay. Um, BHI was formed in 2000, a consortium of 36 of the nation's largest home builders. Our flagship product is New Home Source, so it's pretty important that I go open New Home Source. So I'm going to go open a new tab. I'm just giving you an example of how I go through and how I suggest you go through and figure that out. Um, a consumer facing website featuring, featuring the internet's most comprehensive selection of new homes. Um, you know, so we could go on and read this, but that's a lot of information, a lot of where you're going to get the information from. The other thing you can do is right up here at the top, it said, see all 214 employees on LinkedIn. Here's what I know. Everybody doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. So when it says see all 214, that gives me an idea that they're probably 250, 270 employees. Now that is unless they have some uh, offices that aren't in the United States because not nearly as many people are in LinkedIn if you're not in the United States. And uh, if I dug into this a little bit more, I'd find out that they have offices in a couple of other countries. So that would tell me that their total employee count is a little over 300, which is correct. So if I go here, I could look at who's there. I could look at the T Tim Costello and what I could do is I can begin to find the people I'm likely to work with and who the likely hiring manager is. And I would spend some time going through these individuals and I would learn something in particular about the leadership of the company. And I would learn something about the team that I was going to work with. Because, you know, let's just go look at Sarah as an example real quick. So when I look at Sarah Smith, she's engagement manager um, um, for Envision. She's been there since July of 2013. Doesn't tell me a whole lot, but if she would be on my team, what I can see is she was over at Fiserv, she was over at Hart Hank, she was over at Bearing Point. And uh, now when I go into this interview, if I happen to meet Sarah Smith, who I'm guessing might be on the team that I'm being hired into, um, I may actually remember, hey, Sarah, you know, I think you know, it looks like, if I remember right, memory serves, you've been here, what, three or, you know, three or four years? And, uh, you know, before that, you were over at Fiserv and Hart Hanks. Wow, that's, uh, that, you know, that's kind of cool. And all of a sudden, I've left a really seriously major impression on somebody because I bothered to do my homework. So you can go check out these individuals. You can check out about the company's site. I can go to one of their properties and I can see exactly what their interface looks like and I can go mess around with their product, right? So go do that. 
The other thing that I can do to learn information about the company is builder home site. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to news about builder home site and uh, chamber of commerce accepting donated items. So it looks like builder home site gave some items, Brookwood forms. So they've got a new client. It looks like, right. Um, and I can go through and I can check out news. And not only can I do that, if my interview is in the next couple of weeks, I can click this button down here that's called create alert. And this is going to create an alert for me uh, so that I get updates anytime there's something new online about build or home site. So what if something interesting happens like right before I'm even going into my interview? Um, I could be on top of something and have something or know something about that company that the person I'm interviewing with doesn't even know. So there you go. Check their LinkedIn site. I didn't, you notice I didn't even go to their website. I probably would, uh, but I didn't start on their website. And the reason why is that if I start on their um, website, um, I got a lot of stuff to go through. Power transformation and digital transformation. I certainly ought to go through here. This will give us me information about us, right? Um, you know, there's their company. So I would certainly go here. I'm gonna learn something about the people who are part of this company. And uh, I want, oh, look at that. Here's some of their clients. They're right here. So some of your clients include, you know, uh, Clayton Homes, David Weekly Homes. In fact, I live in a David Weekly home. I don't, but I mean, I'm just saying, maybe that's what you'd be able to say. Is this stuff making sense? I hope so. I don't mean to belabor it, but I'm just saying that if you go do that kind of a homework, I promise you, you now stand out in a way that very rarely does anybody really stand out. Rarely does anybody go do that homework and it'll make you really stand out. So that's how you learn about the company. The next thing is to learn about the problem. And so <clears throat> what you know is this, let's pretend for a second that you were going to interview for an internal IT job at Boulder Home Site. And let's say that the job description was a typical job description and it says, you know, configure users' computers, you know, solve, you know, end user computing problems. Um, handle backups, you know, do network administration. It's just this list of stuff that IT, IT people do. And then under requirements, it's going to have, must have this, it must have the other, must have the other, right? There's this stuff and job descriptions are usually not great. So now you have to figure out, well, what's the real problem that they have? Where are they bringing somebody on board? And what if you, if you investigate a builder home site some, what you would find out is that not only do they have an office in Austin, Texas, they've got one up in Temple, Texas too which means as an IT professional, you're gonna to to support the 15 or 20 employees who are all in sales, who are up in the um, um, Temple location. And you would find that out pretty easily if you went and looked at their people. You'd see that they were actually up in Temple and you'd find out where all their locations are. Um, I'm gonna take you back to one other thing real quick in LinkedIn. The other thing you'll learn about them in LinkedIn is if you scroll down a little bit, you're going to see what their growth looks like. So their growth has been pretty flat. You probably aren't going to bring that up in your interview. Their growth has been pretty flat, right? Some other companies, you can see what their growth is right here. And you can look at their distribution of employees by, uh, by function too. You can learn all kinds of stuff about companies inside of LinkedIn. Here's how their new hires went, right? So they hired five people in uh, back in October, whatever it is. So in uh, March this year, um, look at this in March, two hires there, four hires there, four, eight, nine, ten. So they hired ten people in March. Um, doesn't LinkedIn doesn't know anything about any other hires until um, in August. So Those couple of people who got hired in August, right? And I could probably dive into to that and find out a little bit more about the hiring that's been going on there. So when I'm looking at the problem that needs to be solved, it really does. What's the business that they're in? And I'd find out that they have people all over the place. I'm kind of going, all right, so in this role, I've got remote users that I have to support. That means that they have network connectivity issues. Um, if they're also looking for things related to SharePoint and their ERP system, I've got remote users. So they probably have VPNs that are set up that I'm going to have to get through. Um, you know, they've got field sales representatives, which means that not only their mobile phones, but, you know, they may have uh, laptop or, plat uh, or tablet computing devices that are out there. Um, and I can begin to get a good idea. So when I go into the interview, I understand a little bit about the problem. So, and, and so as an example, if I was going into a desktop support, you know, IT, IT support type role, I can have the conversations called, Hey, you know, it seems like you guys have, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 employees, you know, a lot of them here in Austin, some up in Temple, 
And you've actually got some down in uh, Puerto Rico and uh, over in the Far East. So my assumption is, you know, I'm probably going to be supporting users um, globally even. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, but at least it means that you went and did your homework. And you begin to figure out what the real problems are. And you begin to figure out why this job is likely to even open. So here's places where you can get information about what the problem really is. is you can take a job description and you can strike out the things that aren't real problems, like great communication skills and things of that nature. But when it talks about configuring laptops, you might be able to find out based upon the people that they hire their turnover, how often that happens. So what we're finding out, you know, you may be able to go in and, and look at the um, things that aren't problems that are in the job description, look at the action verbs and begin to peel back some detail um, about what the problem that they're trying to solve really is. If there's no job description, um, sometimes you can uh, you can certainly ask the recruiter who you're working with. So tell me a little bit more. I want to put my best foot forward. You know, do you know anything about why the role is open and what kind of challenges there are and what I would need to do to be wildly successful in this job? It's amazing to me as a recruiter that almost no one who I'm setting up for an interview, almost no one asks me that, and I don't have any idea why. Usually the recruiter could. Um, share all kinds of information with you if you just ask them. And not only will asking them oftentimes get you an answer, but asking them will make the recruiter feel a whole lot better about you because their problem is, is they need to get good feedback from the interview. So you can Google, use Google and find old job descriptions for that company. You can use LinkedIn and look at the profiles of other people who are in the current job. And you can conceptualize possibilities, just like I was doing a while ago. You can conceptualize, hey, they got people all over the place. They got desktop users here. They have salespeople in that office, but their sales system is probably in Austin or maybe it's SaaS based or what have you. Um, and then you can also prepare questions to help identify the problem early in the interview. Uh, and you will have an advantage because no one else uh, in in the interview is going to you know start having those having those having that kind of dialogue with the interviewer. All right. So you want to know the company, you want to know what the job is and understand as much as you can about what the real problem is. And then the third thing that you want to prepare for prior to the interview is really know the interviewer. Ask who the interviewer is going to be and get as much information as you possibly can. Someone is coordinating that interview with you. And usually it's not the person who you're interviewing. And when I talk to most candidates and I say, hey, so you're getting, you know, I understand you got uh, scheduled for the next step. Who are you interviewing with? The answer usually is, oh, I don't know. Don't let that happen to you. Know who you're going to go interview with and learn as much as you possibly can about them. Where did they go to school? Where did they work before? How long have they been inside of this organization? What promotions have they had? What background do they have? Um, you know, and you can even go so far as to try to understand the types of interview questions that they ask um, and, and their behavior. And the way to find that out is that whoever is coordinating that interview for you, ask them. So as an example, you know, if I was your recruiter and you were going in to interview with Scott, who is the head of sales at Builder Home Site, um, and you asked me, hey, you know, who am I interviewing with? I'd tell you who it was. I'd tell you that it was Scott. And uh, I'd probably be interested to see whether you ended the conversation there. What I really hope you would do would be to say, well, tell me a little bit more about Scott's communication style. Is he direct and to the point or does he really like a lot of stories and a lot of you know, explanation? And I might say, you know, Scott is pretty direct. He's to the point. Um, you know, he doesn't want you rambling on a whole lot and he really wants you to get to the results that you're they're going to do. He doesn't want a big, long winded story. So find out who your interview is find out what you need to do to put your best foot forward, find out what their personality style is like. And it's not inappropriate to ask your recruiter who's are coordinating it. Hey, I really, this is important to me. I want to put my best foot forward. What can you tell me about Scott that, uh, that I ought to know going into this interview? And you'll be surprised with the answers you get. And maybe one in a hundred people ask me that. I don't understand why more people don't ask me that. So know the company, know the job, and now know the interviewer. I guess the thing I need to tell you about that is that when all is said and done, people hire people. And the most common response when I ask people, how did the interview go? When I'm talking to the interviewer, when I ask them, 
how did the interview go? The most common answers I get are either, oh, I really like them, or, uh, you know, they're all right, or, meh, no, probably not, right? Those are the three answers that I get. And notice that the answer for the people who move forward is, oh, I really like them. Now, it doesn't mean they want to hang out with them. It doesn't mean that they want to have a beer. It means that they feel really comfortable with the individual. They can see them being successful in the role. And the number one thing that makes people say that they like you is the fact that you're interested in them. The, the number one thing that you can do with every human being to make them like you more is to be genuinely interested in them. And if you went and learned something about the interviewer up front and you clearly did your homework, they, by definition, like you because you cared about them. It's really kind of that simple. So um, easy ways to do it is you can use LinkedIn to find out about the person. Um, you can see whether anybody in your network is connected to that individual. So let me go show you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go search for, I can't remember Scott's last name right now. Um, so I'm gonna put in Scott and I'm gonna put in Builder Home Site and hopefully that will bring it up for me. I'm in LinkedIn by the way. Scott Builder uh, home site, nope, didn't get me over there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to this more advanced search over here. I'm gonna say current companies. I'm gonna add a current company and I'm not in an upgraded account. You can do this. Builder home site. All right, so I'm gonna pick Builder home site as the current company. I'm gonna go under keywords. I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm going to go under keywords and I'm going to put in their first name is Scott and I'm going to hope that Scott has a, I'm going to put in sales under title and why am I not getting a result? Builder Home Site Incorporated. Here, I'll just run a general search real quick. Hmm, I got something weird going on with my search. It's only showing me one person, but uh, just in the interest of time, I've got something wrong with my search, but in the interest of time, I would go check out Julie Ward, and if that was who I was interviewing with, she's been there since January 2016, CrossFit Central Business Operations Manager, so she's probably into healthcare-related kinds of things. She was there for a long time, right, 10 years or so, Poise, uh, Poise, uh, um, Pulse Point Group, Strategic Oxygen, so I would check out her background. I would see more positions. And um, yeah, and I see that she went to Texas A&M. So I just learned a lot about her and I see she's a Girl Scout leader. So there's all kinds of stuff that I was going to go to interview with Julie Ward that I would be able to understand. I would honestly, I'd go check out their Facebook page if I could, I'd go check out their Twitter, I would go check out their Instagram and I would go learn stuff about Julie Ward because I wanna be able to connect to her as a person not just as a person who's doing an interview, because as soon as I care about her and I know about her, I will have set myself apart. All right, is this stuff making sense? You guys with me? What do you think, Kelly? You guys with me? Put your hand up or something like that. Let me know if you're with me. We're getting a lot of positive feedback, so I think we're all with you. I wanted to ask you a couple questions, though, Gary, that have come through. Um, one of them is in regards to LinkedIn and you know how you mentioned that to find information on the company through LinkedIn. A couple people are wondering if um, you need the LinkedIn premium um, in order to see that information such as the growth and hiring trends chart. Nope. The account that I'm logged into right now, I intentionally logged into one that is not an upgraded account in any way, shape or form. Um, I, the, my upgraded account is under this little recruiter button that's right here. And it's a total, so the platform I'm using right here is the exact same one that you have. Okay, and then another question uh, we had was on <clears throat> someone uh, being over 50 and overqualified for a position. Um, this person was transitioning out of the military and yep. had a problem getting in the door um, because of the high level jobs that they had with the military. Mm -hmm. That their resume was a little more intimidating and they were also over 50 and they just wanted to know um, any techniques that you might have to help them. Wow. Okay. So here's the deal. So everybody has some kind of thing that they think that is in their way. And, you know, to one degree or another, we all have different aspects. So the one of quote unquote overqualified or too old are a couple of the common ones. And um, here's the deal. So I think what it always comes down to 
and this is a little outside. So getting to the interview is a different matter. And we talk about that some in the resumes at rock class. Um, so it's a little outside of the scope of what we have but here, but let me talk to it best that I can. I believe that when someone is looking at somebody and they say that they're quote unquote overqualified, I always want to dig down and kind of figure out what does that really mean? And so overqualified usually means one of a few things. The most common thing that overqualified means is that I don't think that you're going to stay in this job. I think that you're going to get bored in this job. So instead of thinking about you have to address that you're overqualified, what you really have to address is that somebody doesn't understand why this makes sense to you and somebody doesn't understand why you would stay in this job. Um, another thing that overqualified means is that I'm afraid you'll take my job. I'm afraid of you. There's a saying in the hiring industry that goes something like this, or it goes exactly like this, which is A players hire A players, B players hire C players. So if you're interviewing with a B player, they want to hire a C player because they're afraid that you're going to, to take their job. Um, another concern that somebody has when you're quote unquote overqualified is that you're only taking this job temporarily until you find another job. And as soon as you find a better job, you know, you're going to move on. So the way to address that, and we're assuming that we already got to an interview, here's what I believe is the best way to address that. If it were me, I would actually, even if it hadn't come up, if you're concerned that that's going to be, that they're going to think that you're overqualified, I would bring it up. And at some point in the interview, it usually becomes your turn to talk. And at some point in the interview, it were probably, you know, if I was interviewing, I'm, I'm 54 years old. And, uh, you know, I got more energy and stuff going on right now than I've just about ever had in my life. And I understand how to play this game. And so I would certainly be putting it out there and saying, hey, you know, if I were you, I might be a little bit concerned about me being overqualified. I might be a little bit concerned about, you know, whether or not how long I'm going to stay in this role and whether I've got the energy and the rest. So if you don't mind, you know, would it be all right if I talk to you just a little bit about that? And they'll say, well, sure. Which, by the way, is a little bit of a trick. The more I get you to say yes, the more I get you to agree with me, the more I get you to say, yeah, sure. The more I get you to say things like that, the more you like me. It's a weird psychological trick, but the more I get you to say yes, the more you like me. And so sometimes rather than launching into it, I get your permission. Hey, would it be all right if I talk to you about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Now I know you like me more. Um, and I might dive right into it. So, you know, some people have said that I'm overqualified, but here's the thing, you know, I'm tired of traveling that much. I'm tired of being on the road. Quite frankly, I'm really great at managing people, but that's really a headache. And where I'm at in my career is I would like to just be great at recruiting. You know what? Nothing pleases me more than reaching out into the world, finding individuals who could benefit from the new role that we have available for them, making a hire happen that somebody wouldn't have otherwise recognized was a great fit. And two or three years from now, having both the hiring manager and the individual tell me that that was the best thing that ever happened to them in their career. So yeah, I've managed people. I've done all kinds of things and I've run all kinds of systems that where I'm at in my life right now is the satisfaction of being an individual contributor as a recruiter and making things happen like that. I can't wait to be able to do that because you know, you're the, you're the hiring manager and you understand exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, all of that burden that you got from managing all those people, I won't have that anymore. So that's just one example of how I would explain it. That may not be your explanation. My point is, is that was just an example of if you dive under what you think you're being discriminated against, it's usually never about that. You can put it out there on the table and you can set aside their concerns because otherwise they're not likely to voice them, right? If you think that you're being discriminated against because of your age, I think that it's not about your age. The number one thing that I think you're being discriminated against about your age is that you can't unlearn things, that you're set in your ways. And here's the deal. I think that people are. So as an example, I was talking to a group of, um, of, of individuals who are, who are trying to land a new job just this past weekend. And I was talking to them about how you really shouldn't have an AOL email account because it makes you look just, you know, out of touch. And one of the comments was, well, it shouldn't matter what email address I have. And it's like, that's my point exactly, right? That's my point exactly. You think that it doesn't matter. So therefore you can be stuck in your old email, AOL email account, because that's what's easy for you. And the rest of the world is going to see you as the person who has an AOL email account. And is there anything wrong with an AOL email account? No, I mean, I guess it still works. But your point is you won't let go of it and you won't unlearn 
So a lot of it, if you dive under ageism, you dive under that kind of stuff is your ability to move forward, your ability to unlearn the energy and the drive that you have. So let me just wrap this all up and just say, hey, it's a long winded answer to say whatever it is that you think you're being discriminated against. It's not about that. Dive under it one level deeper and go ahead and put it out on the table. Uh, because if you're going to be discriminated against it about it, they're not going to ask you. You may as well open up the conversation and address it. All right. So that's what I got to say about that. I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, I think that was a great answer. Thanks, Gary. Um, this sure. next question that we had, we just have a couple more and then we can go ahead and move on. But this next one that we have was asking, um, in regards to interviewer, interviewers liking candidates, what would you say leaves a more positive imp impression on them, charisma or qualifications? You know what? I don't think it's about charisma. I really don't. I mean, it, it, it doesn't hurt. But in fact, um, somebody who has almost too charisma and comes across as that, I have hiring managers all the time and kind of say, you know what? I don't know whether that person is just a good candidate or whether or not they might be a good employee. So I don't think it's about that. Um, and, and I think it is about quote unquote qualifications and just be super clear that there are a couple of different, there, there are two distinct kinds of qualifications. One is, can you do the work? Can you swing the hammer? Can you use the saw? You know, can you put on the roof? Can you do plumbing? Can you do IT? Can you do medical billing? Can you do the work? There's that level of qualification, which if you can't at least do the minimum level of what needs to be done, they can't possibly hire you. But let's assume that you overcome that. The next level of qualification is everything that I've called that's called fire in the belly, motivation, drive, doing what it takes to get the job done and being absolutely committed to the success of your hiring manager, absolutely committed to the success of your team and absolutely committed to the success of your company. Those are the people that when I have a hiring manager that says that interview went great when I ask them why, the answer is almost always because that the person was clearly motivated to get the job done. And I believe that this person will go above and beyond the call of duty to make things happen. And despite the fact that they're just in career transition and despite the fact that these other kinds of things and despite the fact that they don't have the level of experience that I might would have preferred, I'm going to hire them because they're the person who stands out as the one who really is going to make things happen. Uh, that's that's the that's the answer. If you stand out as the person who's going to make things happen, that's when they really like you. And I think that I wish there was a better word than like. You know, I wish there was a better word than like. Like is way overused, but certainly do people do say, "Oh, I like them." And when you peel it back, they almost always like them because they're kind of going, "I can hire this person, and they're going to work like crazy, and they're going to do what it takes, and they're we're going to work well together." So it's about that. It's not about charisma. Right. I have people who are introverts. I have people who um, have very little charisma. But if in the interview it comes across clear that where their heart is at is let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get real right this second. It's about your commitment to the other person's success. And if I know that you're absolutely committed to my success, I like you. Every once in a while I have a candidate that says, hey, if you move me forward to this next level, I promise you that I will do a great job in the interview. And even if I don't get hired, I promise you that I'm going to make you look good in the interview. And I'm kind of going, are you kidding me? Did you just say that out loud? You're the only person in the world who understands what it means to me as a recruiter for you to move forward in this stage. And you absolutely care, not just about landing the job, but you just told me that you care about me looking good. All right, you're in. You know, it's that easy. Awesome. And it's that, hard. It's, it's that hard at the same time. It's easy for me to say, right? <laughs> uh, but the, the final wrap up on that is if you don't feel like you're a person that has charisma, don't worry about it. It's not about that. It's about your commitment to the success of the other person. All right. And uh, one more quick question, Gary. Do you have any suggestions yep. for screening calls when you don't know who the interviewer will be? Like phone calls? Yes, I think they're referencing. You're talking about like the screening call? Oh, yeah, uh, interview over the phone. Yeah. Um, you know, <coughs> sure, I do. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you won't know who they are, but uh, depending upon the size, I mean, if it's a call with Google and you try to go see who it might be, you're going to have 60 different people and you can't look them up much. But, you know, if you had a phone screen coming up with a company the size of Builder Home Site, 
chances are you could go identify the two or three or four people who it's likely to be. You would go look for people who are in HR. You would go look for people who are in the area of the business where you're going to go work. You would look for people who are in talent acquisition. Um, and, you know, let me just show you. I don't know what was happening with my search a while ago. Um, let me clear my search out, Gary. And uh, so what I'll do is hopefully I've got my whole search cleared out over here. And this is not an upgraded account, right? Not an upgraded account. This is just a standard account. And I'm going to go back to see if I can't make Builder Home Site work. Since they're a current client of mine, Builder Home Site. I don't know why it isn't finding anybody who's working for Builder Home Site. Something. Does anybody see what's wrong with my search? Builder Home Site. I'm going to go here. Out of all these employees. All right, there they are. And now that I've got that, I can go under these keywords and I can put in, I'm going to just try HR as an example. There we go. HR generalist, HR generalist. Eh, that's not going to do me any good. Human resources. I don't have anything under human resources either. Sales. I don't know what's up with my search. Oh, here we go. All right. So I got, if I was interviewing for a sales job and I don't know who, I would, I would continue to look for other people who are in HR. I know they got one person who's in HR. Um, um, Gina Sylvester, Bill Barnes, Krista Shiazas, Christine. I would probably go through this list and I would narrow it down a little bit. And my point is that you can probably narrow it down to uh, 80 to 90% chance of who it is that's gonna be reaching out to you. And the truth is that if you learn just a little bit about them, you'll be the only person in the history of time who's ever bothered to find out a little bit about them. So if it turned out that Gina was the one who was calling you, sales operations manager, and you answer the phone, hi, this is Gary Neal. Hi, this is Gina over at uh, Boulder Homes. Uh, oh, hi, Gina, right? And then uh, shortly into it, it's like, hey, Gina, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you, you could even have linked that in while wow, you're on your call, if it was scheduled ahead of time. Hey, if I'm not mistaken, I think that your sales operations manager over at BDX, is that right? Yeah, and uh, I think you've been there for a little while, going on nine years now. So right off the bat, I promise you that Gina likes me more than she likes the other people who she's talked to, at least, at least initially. And um, one final thing on that is, I believe that the interview process and the decision-making process is not one big decision at the end. It's a whole series of micro decisions. And every single one of those micro decisions, I'm either going, oh, or I'm going, hmm, right? And you want as many oh's as you can so that uh, those kinds of things are positive impressions. And once you get the momentum moving in a positive direction, they like you more. So that's what I got to say about that. All right, we do have a couple more questions, Gary, but I think you're going to address these later, um, just on topics such as um, determining dress for an interview, whether suit or business casual, um, and then also following sure. up from um, uh, following up with the interviewer uh, with a thank you note and things like that and suggestions for that as well. But I think you're going to go into that, so we'll go ahead and let you proceed. I am going to go into that. Okay, great. So just a level set where we're at. If you have, if, if I had to take this last hour that we've been talking and narrow it down to one thing, the one thing I would narrow it down to is that if you're properly prepared by knowing the company, understanding what the problem's likely to be, and understanding who the interviewer is, and be focused on their success and not focused on getting the job, you are going to do so much better in your interview. It's all in the preparation because you can't change who you are. And I wouldn't ask you to change who you are. If you're shy, you're shy. If you're introverted, you're interviewed. If you're gregarious, you're gregarious. If you're all those things. And when people talk about somebody liking you, I think that the too often it turns into like a personality kind of thing. It's not about that. I mean, it's really not. The thing you can most do to impact whether or not, quote unquote, they like you is to know what the hell you're doing and to know them and to know the company and have done your homework because you're the only person who's going to have done that. And it comes down to if you can't do the work, they're not going to hire you. 
if you can do the work, then they're going to hire the person who they like the most. And the person who they're going to like the most is the one who bothered to do their homework and cares about who they are. And is not focused on landing a job, but is more focused on the success of the company, the success of the hiring manager and the success of their team. So if you left this session right now and you under, go in with that understanding, your chances of landing the job in an interview just went up dramatically. And maybe most people aren't talking to you about this in terms of your interview, but this is the secret sauce that is, you know, that's the secret sauce. That's it. All right. So, you know, now that you know the company and now that you know the job and now that you know the person who you're going to be interviewing with, um, the next thing you need to know is yourself. You need to know yourself. And here's the deal. Um, you need to be able to respond effectively when somebody says, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, let me tell you what people do 90% of the time. 90% of the time, their answer is one of two answers. The most common answer is, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a project, I was a project manager over at XYZ company and I kept budgets on budgets and schedules on schedule and, and, you know, task on task. And before that, I was a project manager over at such and such company. I kept budgets on budget and schedules on schedule. My point is what they do is they label themselves with a job description of their last job or their current job. They give me a brief overview of the tasks they perform and they move backward in time. Oh my God, right? Snooze. What, what, you know, if you were interviewing with me and you go into that, what I do is I quickly move us on and say, hey, well, thanks so much. In the interest of time, let's talk about something else because I'm kind of going, you're making me crazy. Right? You're just like everybody else. Um, the other most common thing that people do is, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a self-starter, and I, you know, and they start talking about themselves in those kinds of terms, um, and that doesn't usually go so well either, um, because just labeling yourself with stuff, I mean, it's kind of a you got to show me, you got to not tell me, and super common people will go into that. And I work so hard, you know, one of my greatest weaknesses is that I work so hard and, and I'm kind of going, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Self-aggrandizing doesn't work so well. Here's what I suggest that you do in response to the, tell me a little bit about yourself. I have a little paint by numbers um, example of this. Um, and it really goes like this. I am a blank and a blank. You would fill those in with, you know, um, kind of titles, if you will. If you're interviewing for a system administrator job and the title on the job is system administrator, you would say, I am a system administrator, right? Use their own words. I'm a system administrator and an IT security specialist. You know, I help these kinds of companies solve these kinds of problems using skills that include this one, that one, and the other one. Um, I'm going to give you a quick example of this. I've got a more detailed one. And in fact, if you if you want this document that I'm going to bring up right now, um, um, Kelly will put it out there in the um, um, in the handouts for you. This is the handout for um, resumes that rock. Here's a little bit more complete elevator pitch. My name is Gary O'Neill. I'm a blank and a blank with this thing that makes me unique. I help these kinds of companies solve these kinds of problems. Uh, a few of my accomplishments are, some of my skills are, and I'm currently ready to, right? That's the pattern. And let me just show you one for an IT job. I'm a network professional IT security specialist with CompTIA A plus network plus and security plus certifications. I help businesses get the most value out of their computing investments by ensuring that users are productive, that servers and networks run smoothly, and that IT assets and company data are secure and protected. Examples include these. I'm currently looking to join a company where my IT skills can make a difference and I can help increase user satisfaction and keep IT assets running smoothly. Notice that the focus wasn't on my skills. Notice that the most of the focus is on as a result of me doing what I do, this is what's going to result in, which is happier users and those kinds of things. So this is an example elevator pitch. And, um, you know, since I put that out there, Kelly, if you've got the resumes that rock stuff out there from the last time we did that, if you want to put it out out there, that might be great. Um, yeah. So this is an example. I just yeah, put it up the, be... both the PowerPoint presentation from resumes that rock as well as the resume template. So those are both available in the handout section. Perfect. And so my point is, is that um, the other thing you need to do in terms of being prepared is be be, be prepared to answer the thing about, so um, tell me about yourself, right? If you, if you, if you answer the, um, there's missing pieces in that statement. So tell me about yourself. 
the missing pieces in that statement are what they're what the person is really saying is so tell me about yourself with regard to your ability to be help me to help my business and to be wildly successful in the role that we're talking about tell me about yourself with regard to the future tell me about yourself with regard to painting a picture in my mind that makes it easy for me to hire you because i don't want to have to settle you know tell me that that's what people are really asking and my point is, is that if you use a, um, you know, this template that I have, then I, here's the reason why I know it's going to go well for you is that when I have a candidate who I'm presenting to a hiring manager, what I do is, um, you know, earlier I showed you the, if you were here at the beginning, I showed you the email message that I got back from my client telling me how well the interview went at the end of the day yesterday, right? You saw that, which is, that's the best thing that's happened to me today besides being here with you guys. Um, when I presented him over, if you saw my presentation, it would have said, Joe Chow is a senior software engineer and a Java specialist uh, with significant experience in the internals of IBM WebSphere, right? He helps companies with enterprise class products produce a rock solid product on time, on budget, using tools including Java, J2SE, um, AWS containers and this other list of kinds of things. His current situation is one where, I mean, I use this framework to present my candidates over to hiring managers and my presentation to interview ratio at this point in time is about 99.5%, which means of the people I present, that's how many of them get interviews. So if you present yourself in the same, um, you know, I don't want to be crude, but I make my living because people get hired. And over the years, this is exactly the way that I tell the story about people. So if you use this way to tell the story about yourself, I think that things are gonna go better for you. So use this little framework. I'm a blank and a blank. I hope these kinds of people solve these kinds of problems using skills that include this one, that one, and the other one. And the little bit more sophisticated version is the one that I have in resume is that rock. And uh, that's what I call your talent brand summary, all right? All right, so uh, so there's that. The other thing you can do is it's going to be common in your interviews that somebody will go to. So tell me about your greatest accomplishments. Tell me about your success stories. Um, you know, I suggest you write down three to five success stories and keep them concise. And here's the deal: if you don't have w one thing, is if you're in career transition and you don't have the skills to do the job, you're not going to get hired. But here's the deal: people talk about experience, and somehow they think that just because you get don't get paid while you're in class that so that isn't real experience, it is real experience. So, you know, you need to pack up some success stories with regard to, if you're in career transition, some success stories with regard to um, projects that you worked on, the certifications that you get and those kinds of things. The other thing you ought to do with regard to stories about success is to take something that you did in the past and make it relevant to what you're doing in the future. We go into that in some detail in the resumes at Rock Class, but I'll give you a personal example. Um, so it used to be the case that um, I started my career as a software engineer down at, um, down at NASA of all places. And 95% of what I did was I wrote code, right? 95% of what I did was I wrote code. 2% um, of what I did was manage and hire people. But if I was interviewing for a um, recruiter job, um, one of my success stories would be about hiring people. And one of my success stories would be about, you know, um, we were under a crunch. We really needed to get this done. Um, we didn't have anybody who understood this about networking. So here's what I did to go solve that problem. And the problem that I would have talked about would be hiring someone because that's the only thing that I did back then that's relevant to what I do today. So it's not a story, you know, if you're interviewing for a medical billing and coding job and your story of success um, has nothing to do with anything that would be related to what you do in medical billing and coding, then that's probably not a story of success relevant to that. Now, somebody might say, well, I haven't done medical billing and coding before, but have you done office management kinds of things? Have you worked with a team of people before? Have you ever increased customer satisfaction? You know, my greatest story of success was about customer satisfaction. 
and let me tell you about that. And then you wrap it all up with tying it back to customer satisfaction and medical billing and coding, because if I get it coded correctly, then our client, our patients are gonna be happier, their bills are gonna get turned in correctly, insurance is gonna get paid faster, and we'll have repeat businesses because they're gonna have a great experience with us as a medical clinic, just like when I was back at Target and I had that success with respect to these repeat customers. So write down three to five stories of success keep them concise and make it relevant to where you're going, all right? So now we know the company, now we know the interviewer, now we know the job, now we know ourselves, all right? And the last thing I really wanna to talk to you about in terms of how to properly prepare is how to respond to likely questions. Now, I almost didn't have any specific questions in here because there's 10,000 of them and you, you can't prepare for them all. Um, and really what I want to do is I want to go to this item number three and talk to you about what the pattern is for a great answer. Let's talk about that for a second. Actually, let's start with number one, two minute answers. Know what two minutes feels like. Here's the deal. If I ask you a question in an interview and your answer is less than about a minute long, it feels like you're being dismissive. It's really uncomfortable. You know, uh, a, a, a thing that I hear from hiring managers that rarely goes well is when the feedback is, it felt like I was pulling teeth. I couldn't get them to talk. I couldn't get them to tell me anything. They would give me yes and no answers and I'm just not comfortable with that. So here's the deal. When someone asks you a question, if your answer isn't about at least a minute in length, then they're gonna feel like you didn't really consider their question very thoroughly. The other thing is, is that if you drone on, like I do sometimes, then your answer is more than two minutes long, you begin to get boring. So one to two minute answers is great and you ought to know what that feels like. So try to answer every, you know, answer every, the answer to every question is about your, about the problem and your ability to solve the problem. Um, and a great, a great pattern for an answer is what I call an introductory answer, then illustrate your answer with some story or experience. Let me give you an example. Um, and then hand the ball back. So in a question and answer format, it's really like a tennis match. They're gonna hand you the ball, you're gonna, you're gonna answer the question, and you're gonna hand the ball back. So here's what I mean by this introductory or this pattern for a great answer. So, you know, if somebody asks me, you know, the question, let's just pick one of these, the ones at the bottom of the page. So are you good working under pressure? My introductory answer would be, you know what, you know, I, I am good at working under pressure. In fact, if it's all right, you know, would it be all right if I give you an example? Now, somebody would tell me, well, why don't you just go straight into the example? The reason why is because I want your permission and I want you to say yes. And am I playing some games? Yeah, maybe. Um, but what I know is if I get you to tell me yes, you like me more. So you ask me whether or not, you know, tell me, you know, tell me about, you know, working under pressure and how you feel about that. My introductory answer is, well, you know, I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody loves working under pressure, but it's certainly something that I've grown accustomed to and it's not something that uh, that I shy away from. You know, would it be all right if I just give you an example? And somebody's gonna say, well, yeah, sure. All right, you just like me more because I got you to say yes. Um, and then so now I'm gonna illustrate my story and I'm gonna round it out. And the way that you, the best way to tell a story of success is tell me about the situation, tell me how it ended, and then tell me some of the details um, uh, along the way. Tell me how it, me the situation tell me how it ended tell me something down the middle well you know one of the times we had to work under pressure is that we had a client who needed to hire 10 people before their sales meeting um, and we only had four weeks to get it done that's an amazing number of people to hire in that short uh, a period of time so what happened is by their sales meeting we were actually able to get them 11 people hired and uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we did that all right so it's all about an introductory answer I like to ask permission to give them an example. You don't want to do it the same every way every other time, every time, because you feel like a broken record. Get their permission to give them an example. Tell them what the example is, and then once you and the example is given by the situation, followed by the results, followed by a little bit of detail down the middle. And the way you hand the ball back is to say, "Does that answer your question?" Another way to hand it back would be, "You know, would you like to know more about that?" Or another way to handle it, hand it back would be to ask them a question. So, you know, what do you think are some of the greatest challenges in this role with regard to some of the pressure that's in this role? Get them to tell you something, but no matter what, it feels really good when you literally hand the 
ball back to them by saying something along the lines of, you know, does that answer your question? All right. So that's what I think about that. So let's just go through a couple of these. And uh, my point really is that the pattern that I gave you works pretty much for all of these. And um, yeah. So tell me about yourself. We already talked about that one. We know what to do with that one. <coughs> the next one is, why should I hire you? It's an awkward question. It gets answered way more than I think that it probably ought to. It's a little bit awkward. But the answer is that it's, um, it's the same thing. as So tell me about yourself. Here's the mistake that I see people make and why should we hire you is the one of the most common ones to me is, well, because I'm, you know, of all the candidates you're going to talk to, you know, you're not going to find anybody who's better than me or whatever it is. In my head and what goes on for those of us who do this for a living is you just expose your decision making process to me, which is you just made a decision that I'm not going to find anybody who's better than you and you don't even know who else I'm talking to. Hmm. Wow, that's really interesting to me, that decision making that you just had there. So self-aggrandizing is really not so good. So if it comes up where somebody's like, hey, why should we hire you? It's really easy to fall back to your talent brand. Well, the reason why you should hire me is because you know, I'm a network administrator and IT security specialist because I've got these kinds of certifications which demonstrate my ability to do that. Because I understand that it's not just about IT for IT's sake. I understand that it's about keeping users productive and networks and systems functional and to make sure that IT adds value to the business. Um, you should hire me because, you know, not only desktop support and those kinds of things, but my skills are really sharp. And the reason why you should hire me is because I'm at a point in my life where I'm really seeking an opportunity to work with a team like yours uh, to ensure that uh, IT assets are, are a meaningful impact on the business. That's why you should hire me. Don't make it about anybody else. Make it all about you. And the answer is the same as your talent brand summary. So that's how you respond to that one. All right. A couple of other super common ones. I mean, that we could go on forever. We're, we could talk for days about questions, but it kind of gets boring. Um, the point is that you just got to understand your pattern for answering the questions. You know, what are your greatest strengths? Here's the deal. Greatest strengths and greatest weaknesses. The missing words in these are, what are your greatest strengths with regard to your ability to make me successful? What are your greatest strengths with respect to solving these problems? What are your, because <laughs> too often I have, I have hiring managers who ask these kinds of questions and what somebody came back with as their greatest strength has nothing to do with the job. I mean, everything in this conversation has to do with your ability to solve the problem. So make sure that you're talking about a strength with regard to solving those kinds of problems. Um, by the way, one of the greatest strengths that rarely does anybody bring up, but people probably ought to focus on more than they do is your ability to learn. You know, one of my if, if it's true, one of my greatest strengths is my ability to learn and my ability to learn quickly. Um, you know, I'm in career transition right now and I've done well in those kinds of things. So, you know, if, if that's one of your greatest strengths, that's a super valuable one, by the way. Greatest weaknesses. I hate this question, but it still comes up a lot. Um, what people commonly do is they pick something that's a strength and they try to spin it as a weakness. Oh, my greatest weakness is that I work so hard that my significant other tells me that I work too much. But, you know, it's just kind of what I do. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, whatever. You know, you didn't give me a weakness. You think I'm stupid? You think that I just, you know, that you're going to take something that's a strength and turn that into a weakness and fool me? Never forget that those of us who do what we do for a living, like being a recruiter, every single trick that anybody might want to play, um, we know them all, and it just comes across as not great. Here's the greatest, I, I think that if you get asked this question about your greatest weakness, here's what I think you ought to do. Pick a real weakness that you have that's relevant to the job that you do, and explain to me how you overcome it. Because the real question is, how do you overcome what your greatest weakness is? Because we all have them, right? We all have them. So mine goes like this. Well, my greatest weakness is that in recruiting, it's a super busy job. You've got a lot of moving parts and it's really easy for things to fall through the cracks. I'm naturally not all that organized and I think that I'm smart enough to keep it all in my head and I'm not. And if I don't write everything down, if I don't have this checklist that I go through, if I don't move it forward every single day and I do it on paper because I've tried every electronic mechanism that there is and it just doesn't work as well. If I don't track everything like this, I let things fall through the cracks. So my greatest weakness is I'm not terribly organized and it takes, you know, real discipline to be organized and in, in doing recruiting related kinds of things. And, you know, if you have some other ideas on how I might be able to even, you know, strengthen, you know, that weakness, yeah, I'd love to hear about them. So pick something that's real, 
pick something that's honest, pick something that's relevant, and talk about what it is you're doing to overcome it. That's a great way to, uh, to, to do that one. Only a couple of other things we're going to move on from this section. And, uh, you know, if you've got any questions you really want to, me to take a stab at, I'll happily do that. But there's so many of them. Um, here's a comment. Have you ever heard of behavioral interviewing? Behavioral interviewing. It's an interviewing technique that's been around for a while. And it goes something like this. Can you give me an example of a time when? Right. So if you're interviewing with somebody and they start down this pattern of, can you give me an example of a time when? or something like that, they might know this technique that's called behavioral interviewing. And part of the objective of behavioral interviewing is to catch you in a lie, quite frankly. Um, you know, I mean, that's part of it. And the way that it goes is like this. Can you give me an example of a time when something like this? And you'll say, yeah, there was this time that such and such. I now take you to the end of it and I ask you about what the result was. What was the outcome? How did it turn out? And then I'm going to say, then I'm going to back you back up. What was your role? What was your task? How were your contributions? And I'm going to start driving you down the middle of it. And what happens is that it happens, it happens to me pretty frequently. You know, hey, can you give me an example of a time when you were involved in a project that was really related to, um, you know, active, active directory and, and a you know, major rework of directory oh yeah you know in fact you know when I was at, at XYZ company you know there was a there was a big um, active directory project to uh, to you know, to get everything you know all set up properly and we you know, merged in a company and had to do that okay great how did it turn out oh you know it went pretty well there were a couple of bumps along the way but you know at the end we were able to merge these two companies okay cool so what was your role on that team oh well um, you know, there's somebody else who is doing and I start peeling it back and come to find out you weren't involved in the project at all. It happened inside of your company. You saw it down the hallway. You were involved in a meeting or two. And I just found out that your pattern is you tried to mislead me because you told me that you were involved in something that you weren't. So game's kind of over now at this point um, because you, we now have an integrity problem and nothing is going to end your candidacy faster than having an integrity problem, right? That's number one. Uh, because if you're going to lie to me now, you're probably going to lie to me later, and I'm not kind of okay with that. So my point is, is that if somebody goes into this pattern of, can you give me an example of a time when, know that it's going to go like this. It's going to go like, hey, can you give me a time an example of a time when, how did it turn out? And then they're going to start, what was your role? What were your responsibility? How many people were on the team? What was the budget? What was the rest? And if you started out by giving an example of something that you weren't involved in, you're going to get busted, right? You're going to get busted because that's what that whole pattern is all about. Now, if you, if they say, hey, can you give me an example of the time when you've been involved in an active directory deal or whatever it is? Sometimes the answer is, well, no, you know, I haven't been, but, you know, if you don't mind, let me, let me tell you a little bit about how I would address that. And I think the answer, now you got an opportunity to talk about how you would learn, right? And how you would grow. So, you know, what I would do is I would first check to see if there are any company policies or procedures or anything about that. Then I'm going to go out and do a little bit of homework. I want to spend a lot of time on it, but Google is my friend. I'm going to come up with a couple of different alternatives and, you know, either you or someone who's on my team, I'll probably, you know, share those alternatives to see if has anybody has any input. And once it becomes clear on kind of which direct, which alternative and which path we're going to take, now I'll deep dive into it. I'll probably do a couple of different test cases. I would run it by you before we actually execute, you know, the answer. So, you know, if, if somebody's asking you about something you don't have experience in doing, it's a great example. It's a great way to introduce how you would go about solving a problem, right? Great way to do that. All right. Um, the rest of these, I mean, again, we could go on and on and on. There's just no way to know what all the questions are going to be and what you're going to do. But, you know, what, what might not be a bad idea is you can take these questions and if you really want to prepare, there are plenty of books and plenty of things you can find online about common interview questions. Um, just go practice them. Know how you're going to respond to all of them. And, uh, yeah, that's it, right? Kelly, how are we doing? Got any questions, comments, or anything out there? Any any questions that people have found that are particularly hard? They want to throw my way and see what I can do to kind of respond to. Yeah, we do. Um, this was a great question. I thought we had. Um, how, would you treat a video interview versus face to face interviews the same, or how would you improve upon a video interview? Oh wow, yeah. So that's really interesting. So 
You know, a lot of us, um, until you've been in front of video a lot, it can be a little bit nerve wracking. So here's the deal on a, on a video interview. To make yourself look best, just like in a selfie, you want to position your camera a little bit higher than you normally would at eye level or higher, right? At eye level or, or higher generally makes you look better. The other thing that's important in a video conversation or interview with somebody is remember that the camera is their eyeball. Remember that if you want to look at the other person and not seem like you're weird and distracted, then you look at the camera. Um, I'll probably ought to turn mine on and show you, but um, you look at the camera. And so you may want to practice with that a little bit. It's fairly easy. Lots of different software and lots of different systems out there that you can um, you know, bring yourself up on your own webcam. You could even record yourself. You could go in and you could give your um, elevator pitch or whatever it is. See how you look on cam. Um, make sure that your microphone is working well. Eliminate the background noise because there's a lot of opportunity for distraction in, uh, inside, of, inside of videos. So just practice enough so you get comfortable with it and don't forget to look at the camera, right? That's it. So that's my suggestion. All right. Okay, we can go ahead and go on. There's one more question, but I, you're okay. going to address it soon. So. Okay, cool. All right. So at some point in the interview, um, you're going to, it's going to be your turn and somebody's going to say, so what questions do you have for me? Right? It's now your turn. So I suggest, and, and we're still in the preparation phase because really that's kind of all to do. You know, sometimes people want to tell you all kinds of things about charisma or how to be different than you really are. Don't do that. I mean, be who you are. You're a likable person. And the only thing that you can, the thing you can focus on is really care about the other person and really go do your homework and learn the company, learn the problem, learn yourself, learn the interviewer, right? Learn how to answer a two minute question. Learn how that pattern called introductory answer, illustrate with an example, hand the ball back, make a super comfortable conversation go on. Even if you're nervous, it's not about that. It's an effective conversation, right? And then the other thing you can do prepare is to, um, you know, define ahead of time the questions that you're going to ask. There's little, there's only a few things in an interview that can make, uh, make it uh, what was otherwise a good interview go really wrong. One is being late. We're going to talk about that, but if you're late to an interview, I go, oh, your chances of getting hired just went to almost zero. And the other one is, oh no, you answered everything and I don't have any questions. Oh my God, really, you did that? I know that I'm probably not getting paid because you're probably not getting hired, right? Are you kidding me? You don't have any great questions. Um, so number two there is the characteristics of great question. Characteristics of great questions is that they show interest in the problem, that your questions demonstrate your ability to solve the problems in your industry or for that company. Um, and questions that show that you're interested in creating success for the boss and the team and the organization. So things such as, what are the things that I'm going to need to do to really stand out and be successful in this role? Right? What are ways that I can contribute to your success? What are ways that I can contribute better to the team goals? What is it that the person who really stood out to you in their first 90 days or their first year in this job before, what are the things that they did to really be stand out? So the preferred line of questions that you have are all about what have I got to do to be wildly successful in this job? Just a couple of questions to, um, to uh, so you know, item number three is your first question should be all about how you can create success and how you can contribute, right? It's that because the takeaway that you want somebody to have is that you're absolutely committed to their success, to the team's success, and to the company's success. And so if your line of questioning is about that, you're going to be great. Your next line of questioning might be about the interviewer. Get them to talk about themselves. Get them to talk about the job. Get them to talk about their greatest successes. They're going to like you more if you get them talking about themselves. How can you best help them? Hey, you've been here for about six years. What are some of the successes that you've had? What are some of your favorite things about the organization? Get them to tell you good things about themselves and about the organization, um, and things will go better for you. Here's the deal. Item number five, this is the other real trick, which is the what's in it for me question should be deferred to much later, right? Um, well, what kind of vacation benefits? Yeah, right? 
that what is it about asking that question? Let me back up. You have a finite amount of time in an interview to do everything that you can possibly do to stand out as the as the individual of choice. And you ought to consider you know how every word and phrase that comes out of your mouth consider how that's going to make them like you more right consider how that's going to make you like them more um and so now you kind of get back to um well tell me about vacation time <laughs> how does that make them like you more it doesn't there's nothing about you asking about vacation there's nothing about you asking about pay there's nothing about you asking about benefits there's nothing about any of that that's going to make them like you more so you just wasted your time and even worse is that if in the interview if it's an early stage interview you're really worried about vacation time are you kidding me that's the focus that you have right now schmear right so what you just got in terms of a exclamation point a question or a splat is those questions result in a splat or a question at best a splat at worst right um if you happen to want to get uh, compensation on the table right if you want to get that on the table and sometimes you do um instead of focusing on day number one how about show your interest in long-term success hey if somebody gets a great review in this role at the end of the year um what might compensation opportunities look like in year number two and year number three because that's really what i'm all about i'm really about this long-term thing and making this stuff happen so if you want to get compensation on the table um you know there's a pretty great way to uh, to do that my point is that when it's your turn to ask questions, the most important things you can ask is all the things related to what it is that I need to be successful. The next best things are all about the individual and their success inside of the organization. Um, and all the things that you're curious about that are about what's in it for you, yeah, just put them in your back pocket and sit on those. Those don't matter. The only time they start mattering is once they really once the organization likes you and wants you on board now what you care about begins to matter because uh, other than that it's really just about getting to the next step that's really what it's uh, that's really what it's all about okay so prepare some good and so type a few loose ends right so let's talk about this a um, couple of loose ends dress appropriately have your clothes clean <laughs> that's mostly a joke but it's not a joke it's shocking to me what happens. Um, so here's the deal. Um, my suggestion always is dress one step better than what you're going to have to dress in the job. So as an example, if you are interviewing um, at a and how you find this out is whoever's coordinating the interview, ask them, hey, what would you suggest that I wear? Ask them. The people who are in this job right now or work around this kind of thing, how do they dress and whatever. So if they tell you that they dress in jeans and T-shirts, then wear a khaki and a dress shirt. If they tell you that they wear khakis and a dress shirt, then wear a suit and a tie. Right. Always go or maybe, you know, khakis and a dress shirt and a blazer. One step better than what you're actually going to have to do in the job. If you're interviewing for a warehouse job, and you're going to be in jeans and a T-shirt. Really weird to show up in a suit. Right. Really weird. Um, but it wouldn't be weird to show up in some really nice press jeans and a button-down shirt, right? That wouldn't be weird. And if you're going into an IT role and you're mostly going to be in jeans and a polo, then it's not weird to go in in uh, khakis and a polo. You could even you could even probably sport a vest, maybe, right? So one step better. Please don't have your midriff showing. Um, if you're a, a lady, or it doesn't matter if you wear cologne, doesn't have to be a lady. If you wear cologne, uh, I'd suggest you don't. I can't tell you how many times somebody called me back and said, yeah, I could smell them from my office for 20 minutes after they left. Oh, it's over now, right? Really? That happened? So dress appropriately. Dressing conservatively never offends anyone. Um, if you've got tattoos down your arms and you don't know how that they feel about it, you have two choices. You can either wear them proudly and be happy if they don't hire you because of it, because you didn't want to work with anybody who would judge you for that anyway or wear sleeves, right? Um, so, um, yeah. And it all depends upon where you're gonna go interview. So as an example, you know, there's a company here in town called Dimensional Fund Advisors. I was working with them a couple of years ago on some IT positions. And what the candidate going in to interview with, I know that they, I knew that they had tattooed sleeves. Um, you know, I knew some things like that. And I was like, hey, 
you know, you probably ought to wear long sleeves and, you know, well, I've got a right to have tattoos. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, you do. You really do. And they have a right to judge you for that. Um, and it's their business. And when you work there, you're going to wear khakis and ties. Well, I shouldn't have to. It's like, okay, you whatever. So all I know is that it's about dressing appropriately for that particular role. And, uh, you know, how you dress is not a protected class. So I can not hire you because of how you dress. I can. All right. Um, know how to get there. Here's my suggestion. If you're not in the parking lot 20 minutes before your interview, you are late. If you're not in the parking lot 20 minutes before your interview, you are late. But don't go into the office until five minutes before your interview because otherwise when you go in and you're 20 minutes early and whoever greets you lets the interviewer know, they're going, what? Why are they here early? And now you've got them distracted. They're thinking about some other stuff and they're super busy with some other things. That wasn't a great impression. So be in the parking lot 20 minutes early, go in about five minutes early. If you can, drive there the day before I, that's what I do for business meetings because I learned the hard time that I had an address and what I found out was the address was for a business complex that was like five acres and it had building A, B, C, D, E, F, and G and I didn't know what building they're in and you know all I had was a suite number and the building number, the suite numbers aren't on the outside of the building and they just moved into this complex and if they aren't on the, um, the index board yet, oh my god, really? And so I ended up late to meetings. So go there the day before. And in fact, if you don't know how people dress, go there the day before if you can and watch the people walking out and you see how they dress and dress nicer than they are, right? You need to have a phone number, have the main phone number for where you're interviewing, have the phone number of the interviewer, have the phone number of the recruiter or somebody in HR. So in the unlikely event that you are running late or having trouble or whatever it is that you got somebody that you can call, if you're going to be late, oh my God, please don't be late. If you're going to be late though, don't be the person who shows late. Be the person who called 10 minutes ahead of time to say that you were going to be 10 minutes late. At least that might help you recover from that. Uh, but being late is almost unrecoverable, right? It just is. So that's it. Time with loose ends. Kelly, have you still got any questions out there you want me to answer? Or you think I'm going to about to answer them now? Uh, we do. I wanted to ask a couple of them. Um, okay. what are some suggestions if you get anxious and lose your train of thought during the interview? You know what? Here's, uh, so that question makes me smile. And the reason why is because, um, I don't expect you to not be nervous. People don't expect you to not be nervous. This is kind of a big deal. And the people interviewing you know that it's a big deal. I think that there's so much that's been dehumanized about the recruiting and hiring process that you have a real opportunity to become human at that point in time. I don't think that it's inappropriate to smile, to pause for a second. You could even go so far as to say, um, um, you know, you could even say, you know, hey, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm so sorry. You know, could you repeat your question again? And, um, you know, honestly, it, 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 I wouldn't do it on purpose. But I think it's it's an opportunity to become human is really what it is, and to don't sweat it too much, and to it's okay to be nervous, and it's okay to say, hey, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm so sorry. You know, could you repeat your question again, or you know, reframe this, or just give me just a moment, right? It's not a bad thing. All right. And how would you move forward if the interview starts off with um, the interviewer that the interviewer says that they don't have any questions to start with? That the interviewer doesn't yeah. have any questions? Correct. So they want you to start the interview. Wow. That would be my ideal situation, by the way. I mean, I, I really think that you ought to be so prepared that if it's an hour long interview and I'm the interviewer, I ought to be able to just say, hey, Kelly, you know what? I'm so glad that you're here. You know, I can't wait to hear your ideas on what we're going to do to solve the problems we got. So why don't you just go? You know, wow. All right. So it's pretty simple, right? For me, I would start off with saying, okay, great. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I've done a lot of homework, so let's just start there. And I would go over, here's what I've learned about the company, right? 
you're this kind of company, you solve these kinds of problems, you know, your differentiators in the marketplace are these kinds of things, your customers are this and an ideal customer for you, um, or these kinds of things, you've been growing like this and here's what I understand about your company. Now, I have the job description, but you know, it doesn't tell the whole story. So I can imagine from the kind of company that you are, that the likely problems you have are these, right? You probably have these kinds of problems is probably what I'm imagining. Um, and, you know, is, is that right? Am I kind of on track here? And you can kind of check in every once in a while to see whether or not you're on track. All right, cool. So, you know, if these are the kinds of problems that we're really dealing with, let me tell you how I'd go about solving those problems. So I think that if you have a good story to tell, your story starts with, here's what I understand about your company. Here's what I understand about the problems that you're likely facing. And here with the skills and the experience and the background and the motivation and the drive that I have, here's how I would approach solving those. And now I would switch into, you know, and not just solving those problems, but creating success for the team and creating success for you. Um, and I believe that if I make those kinds of things happen, then in the end, you know, it'll create success for all of us, including me. So, uh, you know, I think that that's the story. And I think it, it really, in some sense, if you were prepared to have a interview where somebody didn't have any questions, I'm not sure if you're properly prepared that you could have any situation that would be better than that one because every if they're if they're treating everybody the same way, you're the only person who's going to be able to have a reasonable way to respond to that. So I hope that answers the question, but that's what I would do. Um, and it's not inappropriate in that situation to ask them questions along the way, starting with validating your assumptions. You know, hey, here's what I just told you about the the company. I mean. You know, do you find that to be true? What do you think? I mean, am, am, I, am I on track? And their answer will be, well, yeah, you're on track, but let me correct it just a little bit. And you can get them to talking and uh, you can get them talking about themselves too. So is this the problem? What problems do you have? How much, you know, so you can turn it around. Easier said than done. I do understand that. Um, even if you can't turn it around, you become the interviewer. What you can certainly do is tell your story. Tell the story of the company, tell the story of the problem, and then the opportunity to tell your own story. So if you're this kind of company with these kinds of problems, well, I'm a network security you know, administrator and IT security specialist with this thing that makes me unique. You know, I'm focused on, and now it's a great chance to, uh, to give your elevator pitch. So that's what I would do. All right. Uh, and then next question, and then we can go ahead and move on. But uh, what would you say when the interviewer asks um, what kind of salary you expect to make? You know, that's a, you know, that's sometimes the $64,000 question. So, um, you know, we could have a whole session on just this, but the short version is you can do a little bit of homework on that too. You can go to salary.com, right? Let me show you that real quick. A couple of, a couple of tools you can use salary.com. And if you go to salary.com, then, um, you know, there's titles and locations and stuff, and they'll give you some idea on, uh, on that. And then you can also go to indeed.com. And when you go to indeed.com and you scroll all the way down here to the bottom, where is it? Uh, upload your resume. I agree to that. Where's the salary stuff? Job category trends. Hmm, they moved it. Um, indeed. Oh, that's because I'm I'm in the uh, in my account. Um, indeed.com. Indeed salary. Uh, salary search. Indeed. Right. So you just ask Google for Indeed and salary search. So it'll go in, and you can search and compare salaries. So an easy way to do it is come in informed, and it's not hard to you know the way that I would approach it would be like this. I would probably say, well, I tell you what, Kelly, you know, while compensation is important, as is in vacation, you know, it's a total package, right, including healthcare and all those kinds of things. I'm looking forward to our opportunity to talk about that. But what really matters is, you know, um, you know, where's the company going and what's the real opportunity and, you know, opportunities for growth and my ability to contribute. That's really what I care about most. I can't imagine that as long as you're paying at or around market value that we'll have any problem with regard to compensation. Um, you know, I did a little bit of homework and with respect to Indeed and, uh, and Salary.com and what I found is that for these kinds of roles, you know, typical in the Austin area is, you know, somewhere between 55 and, uh, and you know, the low 60s. So as long as we're in that kind of a range, uh, that seems to be what's making sense for everyone and uh, that certainly makes sense for me. So that's how I would answer that question. 
open up with the, it's really not about the money. As long as you feel sincere about it, if it's really all about the money to you, then that'll just come across as insincere. Uh, but, you know, talk about the things that aren't money and then refer back to what it is that you learned and suggest that as long as they're in the ballpark of, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's the going rate, then everything will be just fine. How about that? That sounds good. Um, all right, Gary. Well, from here, I don't know if you want me to continue on with questions or if you wanted to do a quick wrap up. Um, I just have one yeah, more question. Wrap up and then, Perfect. Yeah, we can do a quick wrap up and then uh, and then answer answer other questions. So okay. I don't have much to say in, in this section right here. Right, we've already said most of the stuff. The focus is on the problem. Right, the focus is on the problem. The only thing I want to point out here is don't forget that small talk is part of the interview. Um, I would tell you the story about the receptionists in the process, but there's all kinds of companies that I work with that I get people who aren't obviously interviewers involved in it. I want to see how you behave around other people. So you're you're on stage from the moment you drive in the parking lot, right? You're, and uh, and your focus really is on can you solve their real problems? So it's it's those kinds of things. We already talked about asking insightful questions, and we just talked about compensation. So the only other thing that I kind of have to talk about is closing with next steps and then we'll answer whatever questions you have, which is closing with next steps is please never, please never leave an interview without knowing exactly what the next steps are going to be and the other person's contact information. In fact, it's best to get their contact information at the beginning of the interview because it's really easy to, hey, do you have a business card or something? You know, hey, then usually you can get their business card right off the bat. So. <clears throat> Never leave an interview without knowing what the next steps are. Hey, Kelly, so when, you know, what are the next steps? When should I expect to hear from somebody? Usually you're going to get a generic answer like, oh, well, somebody will be getting back to you within the next week or so. And I'll ask for permission, which is, well, tell you what, Kelly, if I hadn't heard from anybody, if I hadn't heard anything back by, say, the end of the day next Thursday, would that be all right if I follow up with you? And the answer almost always is yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And by the way, when you do follow up with them later on, I can start out with next end of the day, next Thursday, I'm reaching out to you by email and probably phone and say, hey, Kelly, you know, I'm just following up just like I promised you that I would, right? Um, the other thing in closing with next steps is people want to talk about how interested they are in the job. You know, yeah, yeah, you're interested. Your interest in the job doesn't make me more interested in you. What makes me more interested in you is your motivation to solve those kinds of problems. Hey, Kelly, I just want to let you know that with regard to the problems that you guys have and the opportunities and those kinds of things, those are really motivating to me. Those are the kinds of things I could dig my teeth into. And those are the kinds of things where I think I could really make a difference. Isn't that so much more powerful than saying, well, Kelly, thanks so much. I'm so interested in this job. Being interested in the job feels kind of needy. Right? Common mistakes don't draw conclusions, which is I have people commonly say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to moving because you won't find anybody who's going to be better than me. Kind of going, hmm, yeah, maybe I will, right? How do you have any idea? Um, and the key really is this item number four. If I hadn't heard from this date, is it okay if I give you a call, get their permission, and almost always you get their permission to uh, to, to make that, that call. Um, after the, the feedback, call your recruiter from the car. If you have one, let them know your advocate, your recruiter can be your biggest advocate. I suggest that you send your email thank you, not right afterwards, but the next day. And the reason why is because you're already top of mind for me today. Um, if you send me an email thank you today, then it, you didn't, it didn't do you much good. Um, it's a lot better to well, like wait a day. So if I interview you today, I want a note from you tomorrow. Then you bring me back to top of mind, right? The only other thing that I've got is there's that other handout that's uh, that is in the um, in the handout stuff uh, and that you can download the interview follow up PDF and uh, this is my suggestion for how you follow up after the um, the meeting so it goes something like this I don't I won't read these to you it'll be pretty self evident hi my name is Gary O'Neill we met last Thursday about a Windows administrator position on your team I promised you I'd follow up see that's how I got their permission I promised you that I would follow up. Since we spoke, I've been thinking about this or I learned about this thing or whatever you might be interested in. I know you're busy. Just wanted to check to see if there's anything I can do to help. And I can answer any questions you might have. I look forward to next steps. Bam. All right. Pretty solid. Um, and then if I hadn't heard back from you in a few more days, let an interview with you on Wednesday the night. I'm motivated to make a difference. Do what it takes to be successful on your team. Right. That's all. And then eventually you can go to this, which is the takeaway close. Hi, my name is Gary O'Neill. It's been a few weeks since I interviewed for the Windows Administrator role in your team. I remain interested in the opportunity, uh, but I assume that things aren't going to move forward to next steps. I appreciate your time and your consideration. 
This is called the takeaway close, because what happens at this point is, once you send that, you no longer have to wonder anymore because you're the one who closed the door. Or number two, if they're really interested in you, um, as humans, we want what we can't have. And if they were really interested in you, they've just been busy, they're gonna follow up and they're gonna say, hey, hey, wait, 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 hang on a second, right? They're not gonna let you go if they were interested in you because of this. In fact, the weird thing is if they're concerned Considering between you and another candidate and it's been a while the fact that you're taking yourself out of consideration is actually going to make you that candidate that they're more interested in um, so yeah and, and what it does is it just sets you free it gets you some, a little bit of closure in terms of what's going on and it gives you some control so that's what I suggest you do in terms of a follow-up style all right all right well that's what I had to tell you about that and I'm happy to answer questions and things like that so uh, hopefully everyone who's here you know we're officially done but I'll answer a few questions I hope you got some good things out of this send me a message connect with me on LinkedIn let me know what you liked and what you didn't like and I'm um, happy to help awesome what else Thank you got you. out there yeah um, while people are uh, asking their questions go ahead and get those in now guys just want to let you know that um, you know reach out to New Horizons for any of your training needs we also have career consultants on staff to assist you you know with your resume building or anything like that to um, assist you in getting hired so reach out to your local New Horizons if you are not familiar with your local New Horizons or career consultant at your New Horizons you can visit newhorizons.com. You can do a zip code search there and find your nearest center and their contact information as well. Also wanted to point you to our webinars page. We offer a variety of webinars that we cover. Um, so if you visit our website at newhorizons.com, click on the webinars link. There you will see an updated schedule of all of our webinars through the end of the year. These are all complimentary for you to attend. So I highly recommend you attend them. I mean, you get great tips, um, you know, and even some handouts as Gary has in his sessions as well. So highly recommend you attend them. We also have a link to our webinar recordings page, which is our past webinar recordings. We have over 40 of these available in our archive library. So it's on the webinars tab. Just click on the webinar archive link and you'll see a bunch of them there as well. I wanted to point you guys, a couple weeks ago we had a business etiquette webinar. A lot of great information was um, in that session that is linked to this session as well. So um, if you didn't have a chance to attend that business etiquette webinar and you wanted to get more information, you know, um, in regards to interviews and things like that, uh, that's a great one to listen to as well. So let's get to those questions real quick. Um, okay, let's see here, Gary. On the video interview, how do you ask the name and email address since there is not a business card? Um, I have had I have had the interviewer change on me and due to the adrenaline rush, I had forgotten their name. So how would you go about doing that in a video, video interview as opposed to in person? You know, probably the same way. I mean, if it was uh, you and I on the video call right off the bat, you know, it might be, hey, you know, Kelly, thanks so much for your time and the rest. Um, you know, how do you spell your name exactly, right? I might have looked you up on LinkedIn. And hey, would you mind, you know, what's your email address? I'd love to be the opportunity to be able to follow up with you. And usually people are gonna give it to you. I like to just get it out there right off the bat. And, uh, cause what are they gonna do? And I'll say, no, you can't have my email address, right? So uh, that, that would be super rare, uh, but I get it out of the way, like right off the bat. All right, uh, next question we have is in regards to when it's a group interview, is it appropriate to add their names when you email your thank you letter? Oh yeah, in fact, um, I had a candidate just about two months ago who got taken out of consideration because they didn't follow up with, they followed up with a couple of people who were on the panel, but not everyone. And they thought that that was really inappropriate. And so, yeah, they were taken out of consideration because they didn't. So, yeah, I think it's appropriate to uh, to follow up. You could follow up with them individually, but it's not inappropriate to have one message that goes to the entire panel. All right. Um, and I think with that, we can go ahead and wrap things up. We did have a couple questions in here that were uh, more specifically related to um, certain situations. So for those, everyone, I'd like to point you to um, your local New Horizons career consultant for assistance with those questions, um, and they'll definitely be able to help you guys. So thank you again so much, Gary, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure having you. It's always a pleasure being here. Thanks so much, everyone.
Thanks, everyone. Take care. I will be sending you all the link to view today's session recording for anything you may have missed. And if you weren't able to grab those handouts there, uh, feel free to send me an email and I will go ahead and uh, send those to you as well. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.